Hi, and welcome to Best Practices for Azure Systems API Manager. My name is Stefan Wittmann, and I am a Product Manager for Interoperability in the Database Platforms Group at InterSystems. I have been with the company for over 14 years now in various roles. I'm based in Germany, um, so if I speak funny, let me know. In this session today, in the next 20 minutes, we're going to cover um, three topics that we usually get questions around IAM. Um, as first topic, we're going to discover the concept of workspaces and how you can leverage them best. Um, as a second topic, we're going to discuss the quite simple concept of routes, uh, but they actually can become quite complex. Um, and we want to understand uh, what's the best way to set up routes um, so that you can leverage IAM to its full extent. Um, as a third and last topic, we're going to cover infrastructure setup and very common questions around uh, how you're supposed to set up IAM for uh, uh, handling larger amounts of load or for high availability use cases. So without any further ado, let's take a look at workspaces. Workspaces are a very similar concept to namespaces in Iris. Uh, it allows you to separate concerns and uh, load different kinds of definitions for routes and services so that you can have multiple teams work on different setups at the same time and ease collaboration. Um, before we dive into how you're supposed to set up workspaces, it's important to understand the limitations of workspaces. So as at the moment uh, when you create a service or a route, IAM is going to um, evaluate if there are any conflicts around elements that are already within the same workspace or another workspace. Um, let's say I have a route um, that's targeting slash API, uh, a very common route. Um, um, it's not very specific. Um, and I create another route in the same workspace for slash API, then that's obviously a conflict, right? I have two routes targeting the same kind of API traffic. Now, within one workspace, I am actually would allow me to create this second route, and then I could start to um, differentiate uh, one route over the other and say, um, hey, uh, it's, this route only hits if there's a certain kind of a host in there, if there's a certain kind of a header inside the route, uh, inside the request. Um, so IAM would allow me to set up a route with a conflict. Also, because within the workspace, there's a concept of setting um, the evaluation priority with the records priority field um, so that you can say which route actually hits the API traffic first and which one hits it uh, second or at last. Um, outside of workspaces, there is no such concept of a priority queue. Um, and therefore, everything that looks like a conflict is just going to be denied at creation time. So I wouldn't be able to create a route slash API in another workspace if it already exists in another day, in, a, in, in another, any other workspace, right? Except the one that I'm in right now, uh, just to avoid this um, ambiguity, right? Um, so that's very important to understand. Um, that this is uh, that there's some kind of a conflict resolution uh, inside IAM, and we have to understand this in order to be able to really work together across multiple workspaces together. Because um, if I have, let's say, an Iris instance that's sitting at this wonderful IP address, and I'm creating a service targeting this Iris instance in workspace A, and I want to target the same Iris instance in workspace. B as well, uh, this is what it usually would look like, I am is going to deny my request to create the second service because there's obviously a conflict going on between those two services. So this is something I have to have in mind when I create services. The solution to this challenge is to create something which is called a shared service, a shared entity. Same is true for routes um, in IAM. The way how this works is that you create a service in the default workspace. The default workspace is basically a grab bag for every entity 
that's not existing in another workspace. The default workspace is only the only is also the only workspace that exists when you bring up IAM for the first time. So you're creating your Iris uh, service in the default workspace, and then you can create a shared service in the other workspaces that basically point um, to the Iris service in the default workspace. So basically, it's just one entity. It's not three separate entities. Um, so if I change the IP address in any anywhere in my IAM instance, in the default workspace or in workspace A, it doesn't matter. Um, all the other occurrences of my Iris instance are going to be updated automatically because it is the same entity. And that makes your life um, also so much easier. So always have that in mind. If you have a service you want to share across workspaces, create it in the default workspace and then point to it um, from the individual workspaces. So now let's talk about routes. So this is a really important topic. Uh, I can't stre stress this enough. Never ever build a route that is a catch-all for all of your API traffic. Never build a route which is just capturing, let's say, slash API or even, let's say, slash API slash v1 for your first uh, version of your API. Um, it's not giving you enough detail. It's not giving you enough granularity to manage your API traffic. Um, it's going to tell you, like, let's say, uh, you got like 5,000 requests over the last five minutes, but that's about it. You don't know which endpoints got really called. You only know that some endpoints somewhere in your API v1 got called, but not which ones, right? You don't know which of the endpoints has problems with authentication, which ones uh, is getting a high load, and which ones are absolutely underutilized. You just don't know, right? Because traffic in, in IAM is always um, uh, basically aggregated into consumers, routes, and services. So the more routes you set up, um, the more granularity you get in your analytical insights and also in your capability of maintaining and uh, and controlling your APIs. So the ideal setup is to create one route for every endpoint that you have with all of the HTTP verb combinations that you support. So if you have an endpoint, let's say, slash article, you might support it with the get HTTP verb for getting an article, but also with the post HTTP verb for posting an article to your server. These would be two individual uh, routes in IAM. This allows you to identify if people are more uh, querying your server to um, understanding which APIs, uh, which articles are available to them, or if they're actually putting uh, or posting articles onto your server all the time or if there are specific peak times when this is happening. Again, with a crab back route, this would not be possible. Also, this one route for every endpoint, every HTTP verb combination, gives you super, super control over um, all your APIs in such a way that you can start to rate limit individual endpoints that are seeing a high load and that are overloading your server you can start to take down one individual endpoint for maintenance um, while all the others are still operating. Um, the opportunities are sheer countless, right? Um, so always, always um, use this, ru this rule. Have this always in mind when you're building your, your, your routes in IAM, please. Um, the other thing uh, that you have to have in mind, sometimes your um, routes have to be a bit more dynamic. Let's say um, a very common use case is that the UI of your requests um, include a dynamic variable, like let's say the name of the namespace that you're targeting. Let's say uh, we have this in the UEMA or the deep sea um, APIs that come with Iris. You can specify the name of the namespace that you want to run this logic on. And obviously this is dynamic content within the UI. Um, the way how you deal with this is by embedding a regular expression, a regex, into um, the route. And this allows for dynamic content. It's important to have in mind that IAM evaluates regular expressions by the PCRE, 
um, the Perl compatible regular expression language. Um, so make sure to understand um, uh, how regular expressions are built there. Um, but even if you read the documentation, you probably won't get it right the first time. At least I never do. Uh, but if you're one of those people uh, who built a regular exp uh, expression and they work for the first time, congratulations, let me know. <laughs> so the one key takeaway from this slide is really the more RAL to build, the more it pays off. Really, believe me. The next big topic we want to dive into is infrastructure setup. So when you start IAM for the first time using the Docker Compose file that we ship, um, what's going to happen is that we launch one node of IAM um, and that's linked to one node of a database. Um, and literally this is already a cluster. Um, but what you usually do for IAM clusters is you add another node of IAM and link it to the same database. Um, so this means that you have two nodes of IAM linked to the same database and because the configuration is stored in the database, both IAM nodes are going to share the same configuration. They're going to be set up exactly identical. And that means they have the same services, the same routes, the same workspaces, same plugins that are enabled, and they will also share the same analytical insights, right? So all the API traffic that goes through one node is also visible on the other node, right? So you get a complete aggregated view of your API traffic. And that's really powerful. Um, that's an IAM cluster. Usually when you build these clusters, what you want to do is uh, position a load balancer like F5 in front of your IAM cluster. So um, uh, a very common diagram of what you're going to find in the field um, is this. That's a typical setup. You have the load balancer in front of your IAM cluster, which is formed by at least one node, but typically two. And they are linked to the same database. Um, this already gives you an HA mode, a high availability node for IAM. Uh, if you want to have uh, HA for your database as well, then you need to set up uh, a second instance of your database um, that's getting mirrored as a secondary database. Um, and that allows you to switch over to your second data, second database uh, if the first fails over. Um, this is a very typical setup. In terms of throughput, um, you usually don't need a second IAM node. So one node on a laptop like uh, the one that I'm running, a MacBook Pro, um, can easily handle 20,000 TPS. Um, that's, that's quite a lot actually. So if I have uh, a typical setup with one, uh, sorry, with two nodes of IAM, um, that's already 40,000 TPS that you can handle. And that's usually more than enough uh, for the simpler use cases. If you have a more complex infrastructure or a more complex um, um, problem that you need to solve, um, then please always reach out to us and we're happy to help you identify what kind of infrastructure you need um, to solve your challenge. So now, why don't we take a look at this in action now that we've handled everything in the theory? Let's take a look at my IAM instance here. I've set up multiple workspaces, the default workspace and the test workspace. Both workspaces currently have zero services defined um, and therefore zero routes. Um, there's no traffic going through them, obviously. They're completely empty. Um, let's take a look at uh, a little script that I've set up here in a virtual machine. And it's going to set up IAM for a REST application that I've set up on an Iris instance. So I'm pointing it to the uh, IP address of my IAM container and I'm telling it which REST application I would like to um, set up for IAM. As soon as I run this script, what's going to happen is, if I reload this page, it's going to set up one service in the default workspace, which is my Iris instance, and one service as well in my test workspace, which is a shared service for my Iris instance. So let's take a look at this. The default workspace has exactly one service set up for my Iris instance with the IP 192.168.2.121. Um, the ID, we're going to take a note of the first couple of characters, DC2C. If we take a look at the configuration here, 
um, it's basically everything very default. Um, the host is defined and the port is defined. All right, that's what we really care about. Okay, let's take a look at the test workspace. The test workspace also has one service defined for my Iris instance with exactly the same ID as the service that's set up in the default workspace. And that makes it a shared, a shared service. Um, so if I go into this definition uh, here and change the IP from one to one to let's say one to two, and I save this, it's obviously being reflected here, but also when I switch workspaces, it's reflected in the default workspace as well, right? Remember, it's the same entity. So let's change it back to the real IP address so we don't mess up. Okay, going to our test workspace, which is where we want to do our work, um, this script also set up multiple routes uh, linked to my iris service for every single endpoint that the UEMA API offers for all the different HTTP verbs that are supported. This will give you proper in insights into which APIs are actually used and how often they are invoked. If there is an error on one individual endpoint, you can directly figure it out by just going into that endpoint and then taking a look at the status codes that are being returned on this individual endpoint HTTP verb uh, combination. Now that we've seen some of this in action, let's take a look at the key takeaways. Make sure to uh, leverage workspaces and divide and conquer, allowing multiple teams to work on, on separate projects at the same time and isolate concerns. For routes, always make sure to never ever build a grab back for your API traffic. Always build one route for every individual endpoint for each HTTP verb that you support. For the infrastructure, we talked about uh, that IAM nodes uh, automatically form a cluster if they're linked to the same database. And that allows you to scale horizontally, but also to um, um, offer high availability in your infrastructure. Now, with all of this knowledge, um, let's go out there and build something amazing. I think that's everything you need uh, for a great start. Um, as next steps, if you want to learn more, um, there are a couple more sessions that I would like to point out. First of all, getting you up to speed on the InterSystems API Manager is an introduction to API management and to IAM in general, but it also gives you an outlook to the latest release 1.5. The other session I would like to call out is tell the world about your REST APIs, the benefits of a centralized developer portal. This session with arguably <laughs> the longest title ever on a virtual summit um, is focusing on the developer portal and how you can set it up and customize it to fit your needs. Never forget our learning portal at learning.intersystems.com. Uh, there are a couple of courses there for IAM that help you get started. We are always interested in your feedback and in comments, um, so stay connected with us. Um, my details are here on this slide. You can reach out to me via email, Twitter, or LinkedIn, whatever suits your needs. With that, I would like to thank you for your interest and stay health healthy and safe. Thank you and bye-bye.